Well, ours is still a culture that is trying to find itself. Maybe every culture is, and I think maybe people, people sometimes may have thought they'd found themselves and stuck, you know, stood bat, which is not always good for you. But uh, I felt that it was important to uh, help find a kind of, uh, well, such decisions as what you do with how you set words and notes together. Uh, this is why I looked at the, the examples that uh, were in front of me and by the, by, by the most interesting writers, which turned out to be the great songwriters that we still love and perform. So I suppose I got involved with that in a way without, I never really wanted to be so much in, uh, I was of course mostly interested, I was really much more of a classical musician when I was a kid in the sense of where I, you know, I'd, I did concerts and I didn't play anything popular. I played a bit of sonatas and, and things that you, you know, when I was there in my in, in eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, and I did concerts at those times, but I never played so to speak vernacular music at that time. But I got fascinated by the notion that we needed to do that. Maybe it was an example of Bartok having done, because I studied a lot of Bartok at that time and so on. And uh, my feeling was that these were something that, that people couldn't just disdain. Sure, they were tonal. Sure, they were, you know, related to, uh, well, operetta maybe in a certain way. I mean, Kern is absolutely directly connected with the whole Viennese operetta tradition, for example. But they also were the ones who were the pathfinders in how you set words to music. And so I really wanted to do, find out more about that. The other thing is when I was at the University of Washington, I came in about the age of 17. I'd been there one day a week for six years, and I was able to take any course I wanted to in the English department because I tested out all the requirements so I could take grad courses, whatever. One of the people, I, I did take two courses, I'll remember very kindly. One was from a man named Arnold Stein, who was a specialist in Milton. So I'm this kid, and everybody's in their 20s, and uh, I love that. But the other one was with the great poet Theodore Retke. And he is sort of, because of his personality, brought a number of important poets around. That's when there was really kind of a hotbed of interesting poetry writing and people coming and visiting, uh, 1955, six, seven, eight, about that time. And I took a whole course with Retke. Uh, I was a secondary student. The first, the primary students were people you know were gonna be poets. And I said, I don't want necessarily to become a poet, but I thought the best way to find out about how to deal with poetry was to learn a little bit about how it's written. So I took his poetry writing course. I didn't want to go to an introduction to poetry. I didn't want to be talking about what these mean. I want to talk about the, the, the nuts and bolts, the, the actual words, the, uh, the plastic realities of consonants and vowels and all, which of course was, was his great thing. And he was very disciplined about that. And I had a year's course with that. And I think that, was, that really set me off toward wanting to do uh, word setting. And actually, it inspired The Rose, which is that long poem in Fourth Symphony, which Joan recorded in 1987 for New World, mm -hmm. beautifully, too. And uh, so that's probably what made me get involved with American music as such, because I felt there was a need. Of course. But then I would say that probably in pretty much every country, most of what's done is from their own country except for the international festivals, which used to be much more numerous, as you remember. I don't know what's left of them, really. I mean, I was involved with a couple of them. Uh, but there was much more international interest. But America's so far away, and there's always a certain kind of funny distrust of, of those wild folks over there, especially now with the idiot that we have for a president. But uh, the same kind of feeling as, you know, they're not quite civilized. You know, maybe we aren't, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm ready to accept the possibility, not that I'd like it. So I suppose the uh, business of... Because the other thing is one has to learn how to play American music correctly. There is a lot of nuance involved with the business of syncopation, for example. And uh, one of the things that went, I did quite a bit of work, as a matter of fact, about uh, Ubi Blake, whom uh, you know of from the ragtime world, but he also, uh, with Noble Sissel, would put together the first really successful all-black Broadway musical, 1921, called Shuffle Along. And uh, it was a historic moment because it was, first of all, a big landmark, but it was what made American music different from European music is that we had 
without necessarily even wanting to, integrated a lot of African-American elements in our, our music. The difference between Jerome Kern in the 1910s, because then it was with Guy Bolton and P.J. Woodhouse, is essentially you were doing kind of English, uh, kind of classy, genteel, and so on. Then in comes 1921, and all of a sudden, everybody is going to start dealing with syncopation and ragtime and blues and everything else. And uh, that was really spearheaded by that one show. People went to it. George Gershwin's longtime girlfriend and a wonderful composer and musician who loved her, named Kay Swift. She went six times. And uh, they had to change the 63rd Street space in front of the theater to one way during the run because it was so popular you couldn't get in. But it was a landmark thing. So I guess I'm interested in the fact that ours is an amalgam of cultures. We aren't, I can't say that, I mean, where Britain, of course, would look into the English roots. I had to look at the fact that uh, our songwriting, and our songwriting is really kind of, well, somewhat Central European because of where everybody is from. But also, uh, you know, it's a polyglot thing. We're sort of a polymath. So the person to look at was the person who, like Joseph Conrad, learned English late, and that was Irving Berlin. So his analytical way of looking at how to deal with the language, I don't think he ever sat down and said, no, just a moment. No. It's just that he learned it and could look at it probably more objectively than he could have if it hadn't been his first language. His, uh, his first language is Yiddish, and uh, after that he learned English. And so his whole attitude, even the syncopations are more like Yiddish theater than you'll find, than more than they are from black ragtime. If you want to look at something like uh, that mysterious rag or uh, or the uh, when we said at the devil's ball, ball perfect case. So uh, anyway, I guess I, I I got more and more involved with this sort of a studying it and also saying, gee, there are things I can learn from it. Joan Tower, who's an old pal, we're all the same age. Uh, we were at a music festival. Oh, we were at Tanglewood, and she said, I have to write a piece for voice, and I don't know how to do it. So where do I start? And I said, well, go look at the prosody of Irving Berlin. She was a little shocked. But I, I, I don't know if she actually did that. But that's what I would do. I would send anybody to the people who were, well, Ian Whitcomb, an Englishman who lives now in, in ragtime, I mean, in, in Los Angeles and had very much been involved with ragtime, he wrote a book called After the Ball in which he called those people the song jewelers. They were the ones, I'm talking about Cole Porter and Irving Berlin and Drudges and Hart and, and uh, Kern and, and, and Gershwin. So there were people that just, it seemed to be important for me. It was kind of part of a mission. Besides, it was music that I had always loved since I was little. I had grown up in Seattle and around the small towns of the Northwest. And so I probably didn't have what would have happened if I had been in New York. I would have been going to Juilliard. I would have been going to essentially the Central European stance of schools like that and, and uh, Curtis and so on. Whereas actually at the University of Washington, our influence was more, I'd say, well, somewhat German because of, 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 of Hindemith, who was in those days considered the Bach of our time. I, I became sort of disenchanted with him because I had to play all of these sonatas for instrument and piano. And after about the fourth and fifth, ones, they're all exactly the same. I said, I had been more, much more interested in Darius Mio. And uh, I was able to work with him after 57, became kind of a member of the family. But the point was that everybody thought, well, he was French, and so there was a little. But I'd say that I had more French influence because of my piano teacher, who was the head of the department who from Lausanne. But she studied at the Scola Cantorum, and she was friends with Poulenc, who would send him send her scores of the new piano music as they came out. And I would take them home and play through them and cut the pages. They used to come that way. And uh, so it was from that, and also my... My uh, composition teacher, John Verrill, who was a guy from Iowa, had studied at the Royal Academy in England, and so he studied with Howard Ferguson and, and uh, our old Morris and all those people. And uh, he, Ferguson and he would sit there sight reading, I mean, looking at without playing, uh, say, a Bill Sonata and looking together different scores. And uh, Ferguson said, no, he said, take a little bit more retard of that bar. He's a little bigger, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what it must have been like? So uh, his influence, I think, was English-oriented, as well as being very interested in modern music. He was very interested in the music of Robert Palmer. Uh, Roy Harris was a big name at that time. My second quartet is very influenced by Roy Harris. Uh, I wrote 12 quartets. My 12th was just premiered this last March. But I was writing them at the age of 11 and 12 and so on. So my, my uh, second quartet, I just wrote it was 12, was very, you know, very, very uh, 
Roy Harris. So I mean, but, but because of his interest in, in, in all kinds of music particularly, but I would say more, it was not Central European, it was English and French. So I would say that's more of my background. Well, sure, me too. I mean, you have to. I mean, especially if you're in the theater, you had to be able to work in situations without a piano. I never did need a piano. Pianos, I mean, I love to play the piano, but and occasionally I will diddle a little bit for an idea. But, but I, I think with my, well, it used to be a thought with my pen. Now I have to think with the computer because I've had six hands operations because of arthritis which has sort of decked me as a virtuoso pianist. I can't do things I used to do, for example. God, we just recently, this is an old recording of us in 1993. Oh, we were so fluent, my oh, Lord. Oh, it's, that's long yeah. since, my God. It's terrible what quarter of a century will do to you. But mm -hmm. um, still kind of, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. So we sort of, so we get up there and kind of limp along and mm -hmm. and uh, and <laughs> since most of our audience is our age, they sort of understand. <laughs> uh, I love challenges. I do love different things. I love to try something I haven't tried, and uh, my music varies from. Well, I would say the rags are among the simpler pieces, but they're too hard for most people who play ragtime, I find out. And I've known more people I've run into who said, I've been working on your Graceful Ghost for several years. <laughs> but that's what I loved about the ragtime festivals up in Toronto. You'd go there and there'd be professionals like uh, old Trevor Tishner and John Arp and, and Max and, um, you know, but Bill Albright, my friend. One of the reasons why I'm here is because Albright and I used to send rags to each other. And, uh, and we played concerts together. We were the first people to do a concert concert at the Walker Arts Center in, in, in Minneapolis, you know, next yeah. to the Guthrie uh, at that time. And, uh, you know, so we had this, and I would come here because we'd, we'd met at Tango in 66, and I, and I came in and visited in the next year, and then I was brought back here finally in 73, they hired me. And this nice, uh, I was able to get my Songs of Innocence finished, which I'd worked on for years and couldn't do it really, and a lot of things I wanted to do, so they gave me more time. Meantime, your career began to burgeon, and suddenly we're out on the road every weekend. And that was for a long time, so it was a crazy time handling three different things at once, teaching, and my own composition, and you and me doing our thing. So we did that for years and years and years and years. It's a concern, I wanna make sure that I get everything I have sort of more or less wrapped up in this time of my life. I don't know how many more years I have left. So I've been getting things together in kind of bundles. There's a three uh, CD set of my piano music coming out on Noxos this month. And uh, my 12 quartets are now in sort of a package. I'm not gonna do any more. I did nine symphonies, not because I'm scared of being a tenth one, but because for some, but my, my, but my ninth symphony is about 15 minutes long, just one movement. So uh, my big one is the eighth symphony, and also the fourth symphony, which you sang. Both of those are about 40 minutes long. But um, so I've been sort of wrapping up things a great deal. But as far as my legacy, what will happen to me after I'm dead, um, I've always felt, well, uh, it would be wonderful if people still play my music, but uh, I won't be here. And there's no way to know whether what you're doing is going to have any lasting impulse. People always tell me, oh yes, your stuff will all be done. I don't know, I'm in a way, I'm basically interested in what I'm doing now. I want to make sure that everything is you know, kind of wrapped up so if people want it, there it is. The idea wasn't necessarily for self-promotion. I don't believe in that. Although a lot of people are now giving courses in self-promotion in schools, so I think it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And I have one colleague who, first thing he says to uh, students coming in, he says, well, what, what, can, what can we do to help establish your brand? And I'm just furious by that. I mean, I mean that's, that's just, to me, that's absolutely the cart before the horse. You have to learn your craft first, and you'll find out whether you have any legacy or not. And that, that's not important. The point is, you do what you want. I've been lucky, very lucky, in doing what I wanted. And I've been very, very blessed by wonderful performers whom I've worked with. To me, that's a great collaboration. And I've had the kind of people to work, I mean, some of them are very big fancy names, some of them are not, they're all great. I have very rarely been unhappy with any performer I ever worked with. And I love the whole 
scrum of getting in, doing an opera with all these people and everything together. I mean, I find that thrilling. I feel, you know, I feel that there are people I'm working, it, you know, to me it's a big collaboration. I don't look at myself as an autocrat trying to pound people into doing what my willing is. I mean, I'm work, partly maybe it was working with people like Paul Sills, the improvisational thing. If they come up with something better in a couple of notes for prosody, I'll take it. You know, that goes all the way back to Brecht, who had a big, long table in his studio, and people came in, they could make contributions, he just incorporated them. And so I've done that also as a composer. Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a chocolate pot creme is nice, but I can't think of anything right away. Years ago, when we were really struggling, you decided to make me a, a fancy dessert. I didn't have money to buy you a present, so I handed you the dessert cookbook, and I said, pick what you want, and I'll make it. So so dessert. I think your mother had given you that book, right? It, right, it was Better Homes and Gardens. So we and so I just flipped it, and it just happened to land on the ginger souffle. And you took... I, I, I had to take ginger and, you know, grate it and dry it in the roll it in sugar, dry it in the oven, I, all from scratch. And we invited friends over. They still uh, remember it. They're they terrible. want to try to have you do it again. I said, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, oh, gosh. Uh, Mio told a funny story. He was such a great, wonderful man with such a sense of humor. And uh, he certainly knew his own worth, but he didn't go parading it all over the place. That was one of the pleasures of being with him. He was so human. And he was once having... Uh, dinner with, uh, or lunch, I think maybe with Jean Cocteau and and a whole bunch of people, possibly Poulenc, and a bunch of friends all sitting around talking, and you know all they're all exclaiming about their desserts, and Mio didn't say anything, and he says, "Well, what did you think of your dessert, Darius?" He says, "Why did you say anything?" He says, "Well, it was marvelous, but if I said anything, you'd all wanted to have some of it." <laughs> <laughs>